I'm a Lane County Master Gardener. Been a Lane County Master Gardener since 1995. Um, have do donated um, over 3,000 hours to the Master Gardener program. And this is the part that I like the best, is talking to a captive audience. Are you ready to see pictures of my grandson? <laughs> OK. Now, I think there's only one in here, but actually, it's not in the program. I'm going to start off by talking about the, the photos that I have on the screen. Whoops. Wrong way. First of all, because these aren't in the, in the these aren't new pl plants, but they're really wonderful plants that I really like. This first one here is an anemone, and it's a fall anemone, which means that it blooms in uh, September and October, and it's often we often miss it because we think of asters and chrysanthemums and sedums, but we don't think about the anemones. Now, I really like the anemones, but you there, you do need to know. This is deer food. Right before the blossom opens, the deer will come and bite it off. I hide mine behind the grass because then they don't know it's there, and I can, I can actually get them to bloom. So that's the anemone. We often forget about that one for a fall flower. This is an astilbe, and that's Deutschland. It's 25 inches tall, wonderful white flower, great for the shade garden or full sun, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. How many people have Ligularia? It is an awesome plant. Every time someone comes to my gardens, that plant gets the most questions. It, it, it's the size of a rhubarb. This one here is Brit Marie. It's got burgundy leaves, and these yellow flowers just spray out of the center. It's a wonderful, usually about late July to August, it's a wonderful plant. Now, if it's in full sun, it does this. But as soon as it's not in the sun, it perks right back up again. So it, the, some people think it needs water. You can drown it. It kind of is a pond plant, but it's the edge of the pond, not in the water. So, but that's a really neat plant, and I love that plant. It is just fantastic. This is a thistle. That's Echinops. And this is a, it gets to be about five feet tall. And it is wonderful for the hun honeybees. The, the, the yellow jackets, the bumblebees, the butterflies, my swallowtails, the dra dragonflies. It's a wonderful nectar plant. So, and it's not an invasive one like the Canadian thistle. This is a, is a, is a tame hybrid. So that, that's just those photos there. Will the deer eat it? No, the deer will not eat it. She asked if the deer will eat it. No. In fact, um, the deer don't eat any of those there except for that anemone only when the blossom is ready to open the next day. <laughs> I'd like to start with the Master Gardener history because I think this is kind of impressive. Is that Master Gardener started in 1972. I was uh, 12 years old at that time. And currently, over 110,000 people have been trained as Master Gardeners. How many are Master Gardeners here? Isn't that cool? You guys are the experts. Everybody has an area that they are expert in. And Master Gardeners are, are just wonderful. It's wonderful to have that many. Talk a little bit about some terms that kind of confuse the, the gardeners. First of all, Latin. I'm not going to talk Latin to you, unless it's something fun to say. I love to say lamiastrum <laughs> or simisuffusia. But I'm not going to talk Latin to you, because it really doesn't matter unless you ask me, do I have cone flowers? Do I hear cone or do I hear corn? If I hear corn, I'm looking for a bachelor button. If I hear cone, I'm looking for the echinaceas or the purple cone flowers. So that's the only time it's important, is if you're looking for a specific plant. And if you can say, I'm looking for a cone flower, and it starts with E, I know which one it is, the Latin. I don't need you to tell me that it's echinacea. I can figure that out. But if you, if you don't have at least the Latin, then we play 20 questions. What color is it? How tall is it? Does it have a daisy-shaped flower? Is it a fluffy flower? Is it a trumpet-shaped flower? So, you know, we don't want to do that. So if you know the Latin, so I'm not going to talk Latin to you, okay? Perennials, those are the plants that we plant them once, and God willing, they come back forever. They just keep coming back. That's the God willing part, because plants die. As a master gardener, I probably killed more plants than the average person. <laughs> the annual Lives, la lives fast and dies young. One year, it flowers like crazy. If you hear of a perennial that flowers all summer, it's probably not a perennial. It's an annual, because perennials don't flower all summer. The biannual is a little confusing, too. 
uh, because the first year you've got plant, the second year you've got plant that flowers and makes seeds. The seeds drop. That third year, the seedlings become a plant, and the fourth year, the seedlings then flower and drop seeds. So if you want a biannual to bloom every year, you've got to plant them two years in a row. The plant that flowers two years in a row. Things like foxglove, um, some of the hollyhocks, money plant, Chinese lantern. These are, are examples of biannuals that we might want to have. Canterbury bells, aren't those beautiful? Great big bells on them? Biannual. One, the year they flower, they have to seed, or you won't have them the next year. Ground cover is the, the thing that you use between the flagstones or in a rock garden. You know, something really short that you can walk on. So that's what the ground covers are. When we get to this um, tag at the garden center that says sun part sun, what does that mean? That means that this plant would prefer full sun but can tolerate part sun. And we'll talk about what the difference is real soon coming up. Shade, part shade, prefers full shade, can tolerate part shade. Full shade and sun, that's pretty, we'll talk about that. Moist, well drained, come on. Why do you need to put that on the tag? Every plant wants moist, well drained. Some want it real dry, but most plants are gonna want that. As far as deadheading, that's cutting the flowers off the top. I usually will cut them down to the first leaf because I don't like those stems that look like Martian antennas. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut it down to the first leaf. Cutting back is something that we do with that sedum that stands up and goes like this. Fourth of July, because we all remember the Fourth of July. Fourth of July, if that plant is 10 inches cut tall, cut it back to five. Just cut it back to five. It's gonna be shorter, the flowers are not gonna be as big, but they'll still have just the same impact, but it won't go like that. If it still goes like that after you've cut it back on the 4th of July, it's time to divide it. But it's awesome. I just go through, and you know what you can do with those cuttings? You can make more plants. Stick them in soil. You'll make more plants. See, it's very easy. Very, very easy. We'll do that with uh, the bee balms too, but I'll talk about that when I show you a bee balm picture. Um, pruning we don't do. You know, that's a woody plant thing. So we don't prune perennials because perennials, for the most part, die all the way back to the ground. Now the zones are a guideline. They are not written in stone. In my backyard, my thermometer this year met, went down to negative 12. That means I'm in zone six this year. It was a soft winter, even though it seems like it's been long because it's been so gloomy. With my temperatures on my back deck, negative 12 puts me in zone six. Last year, negative 43 put me in zone three. So, you know, every year is a little bit different, but so this year, none of my zone five plants should have died because they had snow cover and we only went to negative 12. Does that make sense? Just nod. Okay. Okay, we're going to talk about perennials, and these are a few um, photos from my own garden. Um, I like to show you that I actually do garden. I mean, I don't just talk about gardening. I actually do garden. So these are a couple photos from my own backyard. We're going to start with shade lovers because I think people are under the understanding that only hostas and fern grow in the shade. We, I'm not going to show you a fern and I'm not going to show you a hosta. How about that? But I'm going to show you shade lovers. They prefer less than six hours of sunlight. They prefer east or north side if you're doing foundation planting. They don't have big flowers for the most part except that legal area that I showed you. They don't have big flowers. And the foliage is what we're looking at. Foliage textures, foliage colors, you know, and that's what we're looking at when we look at shade plants. Starting here with a 24 inch to 36 inch bane berry. This is actually winter color, and I thought we needed to show what it's gonna look like right now, which has the white berries and the red stems, little white flowers in the spring, and the rest of the time, this is the winter color for this, bane berry. These are alphabetical by Latin, by the way even though I'm not going to talk Latin to you. Uh, here's the columbine, and this looks like the um, Canadian columbine that we grew up with that got to be about three feet tall, and you could suck the spurs and they were sweet. Anybody else do that, or am I the only one? No. Okay. But that, this, is, this is actually only a six to 12 inch. Now with the columbines, if they're in too much sun, they can grow in full sun, but if they're in a lot of sun, they're going to melt down and disappear in the, in the middle of summer. So don't be afraid that maybe that you've um, lost them because they've died down. 
Here's another one that's 24 to 28 inches tall, and it's a fluffy flowered one. We have, still has the spurs on it, but it's a fluffy flower. And again, full, uh, full sun, they're going to melt down, part shade. You might actually keep the foliage through the summer. This is a rock crest. This is one of the ground covers, and it's a really nice little short guy, only 8 inches tall, but it's got the flower on it that looks like a pom-pom. And this is a spring flower, wonderful for the front of a bed or that rock garden that you just want to splash of color. It does spread a little bit, about eight inches. It's going to be a nice mound of foliage. Goat's beard is something that's come, a, come back into the attention of gardeners. Um, there's a goat's beard that's six foot tall. This one is only 30 inches, but it's a wonderful cut leaf texture, and it flowers for a very, very long time. This is goat's beard. Something that, it's an old flower that's kind of come back into our, our, our sights again. Looking forward to that one. Here's a, um, Maggie Daly astilbe. This is a Chinese astilbe like Visions. Um, it's going to be a chunkier flower. The flower is, is really kind of dense versus the real airy type of astilbes that we're, we're looking at. It's got a fuzzy leaf. It's usually got a little bit of burgundy. And it's got little sp spikes on the back of the leaf. That's a really nice, uh, nice uh, stilby. Um, the Visions is a purpler. It's a darker color. Same kind of thing. And those are mine, out of my yard. These are growing in full sun because I've got spring water that comes up on my ground. My water is, my ground is always wet. When you guys are watering your grass in July and August, I step off my deck and, and, and with my shoes and the water gushes between my toes. I dig a post hole and it fills with water. So I've got a lot of water in my garden. So these are in full sun, but they get wet feet, so they really like it. So if you're wanting your stillbees to take off, they need more water. Put a soaker hose around them and give them lots of water. Loosen up the soil around them if they've been there for a while. Loosen that soil up. Damage their roots a little bit and give them lots of water. And they'll take off. Is that dark one vision, you said? Now, the, this dark one is actually Fennel, Fennel. and that's uh, Duchlin. No, that's Duchlin, and that's Ryland. The pink one's Ryland. All about the same size. I think Fennel's a little bit smaller, but since I'm on this side of the camera, it looks bigger. That's a really pretty one. This is Pig Squeak, and the reason it's called Pig Squeak is that you take its leaf and you rub it, and it goes oink, 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 oink. <laughs> Um, this one here, it has the chartreuse leaves when it comes up. It blooms really early in the spring. And after it blooms, the flowers die back, and you've got this nice ground cover of foliage. And then in the fall, it turns red up there. It starts turning burgundy. But you can squeak it. Squeak the leaves, and it goes oink, oink, oink. It's fun. Isn't this awesome? I have to confess, I have many collections in my yard. One of them is a Campanula collection. I love the Campanulas, but what I really like about this one, the clustered bellflowers used to be so tall that you needed to use a tomato cage that can't be used for tomatoes, obviously, for your perennials. And this perennial needed to be staked. This one here is only 16 inches tall. And it's obvious in this picture because it's not just a, uh, a photographer and the assistant going like this to the plant to hold it together. It stands by itself. It doesn't need any support. So 16 inches tall, and that's going to go home with me. I know it. This here is a simus effusia, one of those Latin words I like to say. And actually, it's not simus effusia anymore, but I can't pronounce its new name. So it's still simus effusia to me. Um, I have this in my gardens, and it is wonderful. It blooms late in the summer. So I'm looking out in my garden, and I'm thinking, where did those white snake flowers come from? And it, I remember that I've got a simus effusia among my stilbies in my backyard. This one's chocoholic. It's got, got the burgundy foliage to it. I don't think it smells like chocolate, but, I, but it's chocoholic. Nice plant. Deer, deer and rabbit resistant. Deer don't eat it. The burning hearts, bleeding hearts, this is one of two different types of, of, burning, of bleeding hearts. There's this short variety that's a sport of luxuriant. Only gets to be about 18 inches tall. If you deadhead it, it will bloom all summer. That is this family here. And this one will bloom all summer, a whole bunch in the spring, and then a little bit here and there as long as you deadhead 
all through it. It's a nice ferny foliage, kind of blue-green, and a nice mound, only about 18 inches tall. This one says 8 inches, so that's even shorter of the luxuriant. Unlike this one, this is the old-fashioned bleeding heart that gets to be about 3 foot tall, 2 to 3 foot tall, and once it's done blooming, it melts down to the ground and goes to sleep for the summer. This one's a new one, whereas you can see the older flowers turn red, the new flowers are pink. So it's going to be a real nice dark red in that spring garden on a 24-inch plant. Cool, huh? Here's one of the foxgloves, and this is one of the ones that may or may not be perennial. I think most of the time the yellow one is the only one that seems to come back real reliably and multiply. So this one, if it flowers the first year, you want those seeds to drop. And what I usually do, because it will repeat bloom if you deadhead, deadhead through the summer, and then those last two flower stems, leave them on the plant so they'll drop the seeds for the next year's baby plants that will bloom the following year. These are wonderful attractors for hummingbirds. And look, this is shade garden plant. Look at the flowers. Pretty cool, huh? There's a yellow, or white one, too. 36 to 48 inches. This is going to need that tomato case that doesn't work for tomatoes on it because it is a big plant. One of the new grasses is big blue stem. And this is actually one that would work in part shade. And it, it's going to go 5 to 8 feet tall, which is unusual for a grass for the shade. But it's a, really a blonde grass, um, a variegated and a real light blonde grass. Cool. Word of warning with the northern sea oats. Don't let the seed head stay out there all winter, or you will have lots of babies next spring. This is not a sterile seed head, and it will um, spread quite well. It likes a wet area, so I've got it in one of my wet areas, and it's spreading. I also have it, um, before I realize that it spread, I have it among one of my rose bushes. You know how hard it is to pull grass from a rose bush? I think I'm going to pull the whole rose bush up and start over again. <laughs> it's just something. But this is a variegated model of the plain green northern sea oats. Wonderful plant, three, three feet tall, wonderful arching seed heads that look like a flattened pine cone. Really cool. But keep an eye on it and cut all the seed heads off in the fall and put them in a, a dried arrangement inside because otherwise you'll be sorry, like Don't me. Wait yeah, well, as soon as, as, soon as, you could, as you're coming in, yeah, before they dry, before they freeze. Here's a wonderful one here, um, apricot blush. This is a Lenten rose. Got a couple Lenten roses. What's really cool about the Lenten rose is a number of things. First of all, the deer don't eat them. They're a shade plant. The foliage is evergreen, so it's green even right now. It's going to be blooming within the next month or so. And they come in a variety of colors, but what's really neat is this flower. As the flower ages, and turn, it will turn green, and you'll have seed heads in it that are protrude from the center, and you can leave that flower on there all season long. And it looks like it doesn't turn brown, it doesn't fall apart and lose its petals, it just stays there nice and firm with those seed heads. Really cool plant. There's another one, a purple one. But again, this is going to fade to a, probably an apple green color, and you'll have those seed heads that will protrude from it. Really, really neat. Here's one of the, the um, corbels. This is autumn leaves, and the corbels tend to be about the size of a basketball. And the flower stems come up on that. It's a nice moundy plant, and again, with the shade garden, we're looking for foliages different foliages, different textures, and this is one of the wonderful corabels. Here's another one with a crinkly purple leaf. Kind of looks like um, chocolate ruffles or some of those, that, the older ones. Very nice, nice plant. Wow, look at that. Cherry cola, this one's following me home. To have something that has a leaf that's not green and red flowers on it, on the corabel, that is just awesome. With, that, with those nice reds. Here's Havana. This has got a chartreuse leaf, and then the stem comes up, and you've got these little bristle brush type flowers, more, more like a, a tiarella than the corbel. But that's really nice, too. Think the hummingbirds are going to be happy with that? Oh, yeah. Here's Midas Touch. 
Look at the reds going through the veining on this, this gold leaf. Again, the, the leaves are really important in our shade garden. Uh, Milan with a little bit of red going through the silver. And that's going to be a very interesting. Put, now picture putting something like Midas Touch and Milan together. You've got the veining on them, but you put them in the same area and they would play off of each other. Throw a Havana in there with the, the um, chartreuse leaves and you're really going to have some colored textures going on that aren't just ferns and hosta. There's peach crisp. A lot of different types of peaches. Peach flambe, peach um, southern comfort, a lot of peach ones. This one's got some red in it and it's, and it's highly ruffled. Fiery red. Here's another one with the chartreuse leaves and a very long flower. This is actually a throwback to some of the parentage of the corbels because of the long flower stem. 28 inches for this flower stem and the foliage is about the size of a basketball. Very, very nice. What do you think? I didn't doctor these photos, by the way. That is the color that they, that they are going to be. And this is, you know, this one, sugar plum. That's going to follow me home, too, because it's so unique. It actually does look like it's got sugar. I saw a little baby plant of it, and it looks like it's got sugar sprinkled on it. You know, put a little milk on it, rub it in sugar. Really nice plant. Really pretty. Here's Redstone Falls. This is a hookerella. And the hookerella, of course, is the cross between the corabel and the foam flower. And what the foam flower does for the corabel is it makes shorter flower stems with bristle bush flowers. So it's got a shorter flower stem, as you can see with Redstone Falls, little white flowers. It's actually sideways because I couldn't get the photo to fit right. But this is Redstone Falls. What's really neat about Redstone Falls, and one of the ones that I'm going to show you in a, in a minute, is that these could be a container plant. plant. You know when you build a container, you got your thriller, you got your filler, and you got your spiller? This is the spiller. This is the one that spills over the side and just softens out that pot. Thriller, filler, spiller. And this is the spiller. So put this in your, in your container plant, and in the fall, pop it in the garden somewhere. It's a, it's a, it is a spreader. This is solar power, and the top photo is what it looks like in the spring. The bottom photo is what it does in the fall. So the foliage colors, this is also a spreader, 20 inch spread on this. So that could be that spiller in your, in your plant too. And then the last one of the hookerellas is Yellowstone Falls. And Yellowstone Falls is a, again a spiller, 6 inches tall but 24 inch spread on it. Put that in your container instead of that vinca vine. Who needs vinca vine when you got something like that? Dead nettles. These are, this is kind of interesting. I've been doing some research. I'm actually speaking in Muscatine um, two weeks from now for their Art of Gardening Fair, and I'm doing container gardens, and I started looking into companion plantings for insect control. This dead nettle repels Japanese beetles. <laughs> everybody write that down, and everybody buy dead nettle. <laughs> But this is one of the new dead nettles, and I'm going to try it. I've got um, creeping flocks underneath my rose bush, and, and well, along with the, the grass stuff. But I'm going to put that um, put dead nettle under my rose and see if it repels the Japanese beetles from my roses. Wouldn't that be kind of cool if we could actually find something that we can plant that will get rid of the beetles? Send them off to Ames. Here's a, here's another. Oh, look at the foliage on that one. You got a light green chartreuse with a white stripe in it. And then this is another dead nettle, and it's got the silver leaf on it. And the foliages, these are often used, a lot of the, I think like white Nancy is often used as a spiller in a container also. So what did the Japanese beetles eat that we put in our containers that we might want to put some of this in there too to keep the Japanese beetles away from it? Basil. How many had, had no basil last year because the Japanese beetles had it all? Put this in the, in the base of the basil. Fried green tomatoes is a cardinal flower. I really like the cardinal flowers because they are wet, they like wet feet. And guess what? I got wet feet in my backyard. They are hummingbird attractors. I can actually put them in a pot and put them in my pond. And they'll be just fine in that pot. And they'll flower red right in the center of the cattails that I have in my pond. 
It's kind of neat. I really like the lobelias. <clears throat> the disobedient plant. <laughs> this disobedient plant is supposed to stay compact. Although you notice what I said about the spread? It's a spreader. Because the disobedient plant of old days, the purple one that gets to be about four foot tall, took me four years to kill it. First year I mowed it. Second year I mowed it and I put mulch cloth and, and landscape, fabric on top, or landscape fabric and mulch on top of it. The third year I pulled it back, it was still there. <laughs> Hit it with Roundup then. And finally got rid of, it got rid of the disobedient plant. But this one's not supposed to be a ba bad plant. This one's supposed to stay put and not spread. I will believe it when I see it. The obedient par part of the flower is that you can actually bend the flower and it will stay where it's at. That doesn't mean the roots are going to stay where it's at. So watch out with you when you plant this. Plant this inside of a bigger pot. Or plant it along the back of the woods and see if, if the garlic mustard can outpower this. <laughs> I don't know. It would be real. It would be real a, a challenge to see which one would be stronger. Now we're going to go flip your page over and go to sun lovers. Sun lovers require more than six hours of sun. If they don't get that, they're going to be have weak stems and maybe not flower as nicely. They prefer the south or the west side of your house if you're doing foundation plantings, and they got big flowers. Here's the first one again alphabetically. This is yarrow. Um, this um, pomegranate here is a nice red one. Yarrows, you can keep them blooming all summer long if you deadhead. After the first flush, cut down to the next leaf start, and it will branch out and bloom again. After a while, that one stem that is being cut back and cut back and cut back, it's going to look a little scruffy. Cut it down to the basil leaves, and it will shoot again from the basil. So you can keep the, the yarrows blooming. Now, the white one here, I don't usually recommend because it's a flying yarrow. It flew from one side of my yard to the other. <laughs> so we want to be careful with the, this yellow, the white one, although this has got little um, puff balls on it that looks like baby's breath. So I'm kind of interested to see what its spread is like. I got a question mark by there, because sometimes the yarrows, particularly the white ones, kind of spread out. If, you're use, if you've got a yarrow that is spread out, in the spring, take your spade and go around the outside of it. Take everything on the outside and put it in another spot. That's probably how mine flew, because it flew from one side to the other side. But you can control it. It just needs to be a yearly event of kind of cutting it back a little bit. Here's a yellow one, and what's nice about this little yellow one is short, only 10 to 14 inches. Nice and compact, so I'm hoping that this one will be a, a nice performer. Again, deadhead it, and you can keep it blooming most of the summer. Here's the hollyhocks, and these hollyhocks, they say they're perennial, but I believe that they're a biannual, um, because the single ones tend to be biannual, which means that you're going to have to plant them two years in a row to get a continuous um, crop of hollyhocks. This is a new one called Ma Mars Magic, a nice big red one. And there's Polar Star, which is a white with a yellow center. Cool. Basket of gold. This is another old plant like the, um, like the goat spirit that people had or grandma had and want, they are now wanting it again. This one you don't cut back to the ground when, in the winter or the spring because it has a woody stem to it. So you're going to wait for it to start leafing out and then just trim off anything that, that um, has died. I should mention that about the corbels too. Corbels have a, a, a stem like a strawberry. It's got a crown. So with your corbels, you don't want to cut them off the ground either. You've killed them. Otherwise, you just kind of trim the leaves off. Or better yet, be a lazy gardener like me. Just leave them. The new leaves will cover up the old leaves. And it adds good mulch. And they'll biodegrade and add the nutrients to your soil. So don't do that with the corbels either. And don't do that with a basket of gold. Cut it off at the ground, it dies. Wait till it starts leafing out. Here's a little sandwort. This is another one of those rock garden ground covers. Wonderful white flowers, a little bit bigger than your traditional moss rose flowers, um, and blooms at the same time, early May and June. That's a nice little ground cover. 
Jimmy Crockett here. Jimmy grow, grows really tall, goes to 24 inches, but I've actually seen him bigger than that. But he blooms for, can I get it? Six to 15 weeks. I just deadhead him, and he just keeps blooming and blooming and blooming. He resembles an aster, but he's blooming all summer. And he does get a little bit bigger than the 24 inches. I wouldn't believe that. I'd say more like 36. But that's a really nice plant. Coreopsis. I got two Coreopsis to show you this year that are, that are new. This uh, star cluster, 24 to 30 inches. And what I would do with the, the Coreopsis is particularly these that get to be 30 inches, 4th of July, cut them in half. Because you cut them in half, they will still bloom for you. They'll be more compact, and you won't need that tomato cage that doesn't work for tomatoes. So that, that's a one that I would cut in half just like I would sunny day. Sunny day is again 24 to 30 inches. That's this tall. That's, that's taller than this table. And you get a plant that's coming up like that, guess what, it's gonna flop. If you don't have that tomato cage around it or cut it back on the 4th of July. Here's a Moonlight Blues delphinium. I can't grow delphiniums because my ground is too wet. They need it really well drained. They need a soft, soft soil, or a really well drained soil, not the amount of water I have in my backyard. So I can't get them to grow, but isn't that awesome? It almost makes me wish I had dry soil. Then I'd have to water it. This is Little Maiden's Pinks. I think because of the soft winter we had this last winter, that all of those dianthus that we planted that are annuals, are probably going to be there this spring. I know one of mine is. But this one here has got that nice little ruffled. I've got one called Ghost that looks very much like this. And it comes back every year. I've had it for five years. And it's a wonderful plant. And it's green. It's already green in my backyard because of that nice snow cover we had in that soft winter. It's just been a long winter. Here's Ruby Sparkles. And it's another ground cover, eight inches tall. After it's done blooming that first time, shear it back. Take it and cut the tops off of it. Kind of shear it back. That's going to make it branch out, and it's going to bloom again for you. Isn't that great? Wonderful. OK, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of purple coneflowers that aren't purple. Here's the first purple coneflower that's not purple. This is um, Avalanche, and this is the one that's going to replace White Swan. White Swan's a lot taller. This is a lot more compact, only 15 to 18 inches tall, and it's going to give you that same white flower that uh, white swan does. So I think that that's wonderful. And look how, how sturdy that plant is. No tomato cage needed. Here's coral reef. Isn't that pretty? Now these pom-poms will come out like a regular old orange flower, orange cone flower, and then the cone will unfurl. You can see this one's not quite unfurled as much. This one's almost completely done. So don't be alarmed when they, these pom-poms come out and they look like a purple coneflower form because they will unfurl given time. Got a lot of those. Cranberry cupcake, isn't that pretty? Raspberry co color. And again, the flower is more sought off for the pom-pom and it's going to come out like a regular coneflower, but then it's going to unfurl to be the pom-pom. This is one of those flowers that people who like to cut flowers and bring them inside really like because it's not just another daisy shape. It's got, it's got some dimension and some texture. Here's a purple coneflower. That's yellow. And this yellow coneflower actually has a six-inch flower on it. So it's a big flower and a short plant. And it's a purple coneflower, a yellow purple coneflower. Firebird, doesn't that look like a badminton, badminton birdie? With the cone on top and the petals that go down. Um, a tall plant probably needs to be staked with that tomato case. It doesn't work for tomatoes. And go ahead and stake that one. I saw this last year, and it actually looks like this. This is wonderful. It's a wonderful plant. Now this one, everybody's going to want. Starts off yellow, then the flower turns orange, then the flower turns red. It flowers so much that you're going to have a plant full of yellow, orange, and red flowers at different stages. 
Isn't that something? Inten deep, intense red. 36 inches. What's it going to need? A tomato cage or some kind of staking. Irresistible, another one of the pom-poms. And here you can really see the, the difference between a pom-pom that's almost finished and pom-poms that are just starting out. So it comes out as the regular cone flower. It's um, salmon orange. And that's really, really quite nice. Purple stems on it too, which is nice. Here's Pow Wow Wild Berry. If nothing else, it's fun to say. <laughs> but it's a, it's a purple cone flower, intense purple. This is, let's see, it says deep rose purple, three to four inch flowers. And a nice short plant again, 20 to 24 inches tall. So they're finally figuring out that we don't want to spend all of our time staking plants. We want things that are going to stay, you know, short and be able to support themselves. And raspberry tart, another 18 to 20 inch tall and very fragrant, as most of the coneflowers are. What do you think of that? Isn't that pretty? Secret passion. This is a um, wonderful, wonderful compact plant, 18 to 23 inches tall. That's the end of the coneflowers. This one here is something I've never seen before. The Latin, I've never seen before. In doing some research on this plant, I found that, the, that it's actually a native of Iran. And it's a drought tolerant plant. It doesn't need a lot of water, um, obviously, since it's coming from a desert area. But what's kind of interesting to me is this foliage here. Nice little basal foliage that's needle-like. Nice long petals on it. And then you get this 14 inch flower on top of it that's red. I think that's kind of neat. I'm excited to see this one bloom because I have never seen this family before in the 17 or 18 years I've been in the business. Blanket flowers. How many people can grow them? No. Okay. I, I've always treated them as an annual. Um, put them in a pot. I actually took one of the tizzies home because it was a beautiful plant and it was blooming like crazy. Didn't last through July. Do you know why? They need fertilizer. A lot of fertilizer. Every time you water, fertilize your blanket flowers if you expect them to even live through the summer. Uh, they're wonderful because the butterflies like them, but they are hard to grow because we don't fertilize enough. In my yard, I plant them and forget it. If it doesn't, come back, it doesn't survive three times, I'll plant them and forget it. Three times. But I've, I've had troubles with this. What's nice about this particular um, one is he's only 12 inches tall. So it's not going to be the, the burgundy that gets 30 inches tall and flops and looks really scruffy and you cut it back and you cut it back. This one's only going to be 12 inches tall. You won't have to do that. But fertilize. Lots of fertilizer for this plant because it blooms so much that it starves its roots. So you want to go ahead and fertilize the blanket flowers. Here's another one with the little trumpet flowers on it that the hummingbirds like. It's kind of pretty, isn't it? But it flowers so heavily. This is 28 inches tall. So it's probably going to need that tomato cage. Um, but it flowers so heavily, it starves itself. And here's Lucky Wheeler. This is a blanket flower. This is what we're used to seeing is the, the reds and the yellows and the oranges. But what's neat about this flower, and this is the best picture I could get, I'm sorry. But it, these trumpets unfurl to make the flat flower. So this is really kind of neat. Looking forward to this one. I'm kind of I'm kind of concerned about this 10 to 25 inches. You know, like that's a, it could be either. <laughs> it could be both. <laughs> What's it going to be? 10 or 25? You know, I could understand if it said 10 to 15, but 25? Hmm. That's what the internet told me. Here's a totally tangerine. Got a confession. I've got a collection of GMs. Planted my first one, and it bloomed for almost two months. And it gave me a splash of orange in the middle of the spring, and I loved it. So I think I'm going to have to have totally tangerine either, too, even though it's 30 inches tall. But the GMs keep their basal leaves. The leaves are a little mound, and then they put these nice wiggly stems to get that flower up at 30 inches. So this would probably go in the back of the border or the middle of the border. And let those orange flowers just pop above something else. But I really do like the guillems. I've never planted them before three years ago. And now I have a collection. Haven't seen one I can't, I can't have. 
Um, hibiscus, they can go, this is a stop sign. Because I've got some in my front yard, and it never fails if I'm out in my front yard, someone stops to ask me what it is. This is a stop sign. Flowers can be anywhere from 6 inches to 12 inches. So it's a wonderful plant. This one happens to be 6 foot tall, and, but some of them are only 2 or 3 feet tall. So there's lots and lots of different ones. And they come in whites, with plain whites, whites with red eyes, plain pinks, pinks with red eyes, red ones like this one, which has a 9 to 11 inch blossom on it, and a 5 foot plant. So that's really kind of neat. This is not the hibiscus that you have to put in a pot and bring inside. This one you put in the ground and it comes up. But don't expect to see it until the 1st of June. I've had people come to me in the middle of May and said, I need another hibiscus. It's dead. I dug it out and threw it in the garbage. I send them home to take it out of the garbage and put it back in the ground because they sleep for a very long time. They do not wake up until the ground is really, really warm. So 1st of June. After that, it might be dead. But you should see it by the 1st of June. Here's a Japanese iris. This is another plant that likes to have wet feet. This is not a really good flower of it because it's actually past bloom. But this is a 7-inch flower, and it looks like a German iris that got smashed. It's flat. It's a very flat flower. It still has the, the, sta um, the, the falls and the stands, the, all of the pieces that a regular ger a German iris would have, but it's flat and it's rounder. Once the flower is done, you've got wonderful long, dark green, strappy leaves that give you texture. Um, it, it's really quite nice. Here's one of the German irises. This is the ones with the blue-green leaves on it. And um, the nursery I work at, we only put in the ones that will bloom twice. We only carry the ones that will bloom in the spring and the ones that will bloom in the fall, depending on our fall. I have a friend who has a collection, and she called me up, and she said, tomorrow it's going to frost, or tonight it's going to frost, and my irises have blooms on them. What should I do? And I said, cut them and bring them inside. Called me a week later and said, they bloomed all week long inside. Now, some of them don't smell real good, so I don't know that I'd bring them inside, but she's, she loves her iris. Here's another type of iris. This is a Louisiana iris, and another one that likes water. You can put it in the pond, or you can put it in a wet spot. Put it at the bottom of your downspout. This is a wonderful one. Deep, deep purple, and then, you, of course, you've got those strap leaves, again, after it's done blooming. Gives texture. Lavenders are kind of hard to grow. Several of the lavenders tend to winter die. Um, in Zone 4, in Cedar Rapids, we've always sold Munstead and Hitcock. This is a Hitcock Superior, so maybe this will actually be a, able to survive. A friend of mine who, who is able to keep this alive all winter puts a black pot on top of it and puts a brick on top of that black pot all winter long so it doesn't get the snow cover on it and it stays dry because they tend to rot during the winter. We also don't want to cut any of the, cut this off of the ground. We want to wait for it to start leafing out and then just cut away the dead. Just like the corabel and just like the basket of gold, if you cut it off of the ground, you've killed it. You just want to trim it. So another one that, that's like that is the Russian sage. You know, cut the Russian sage off of the ground, unless it's already spread feet, three feet away, which they do, you're going to kill that plant. Cut it down to six inches with your Russian sage. But that's a really pretty one. This one here, look at the zone. Six. This is the one. Now, who else? Someone else has to have had this happen. My grandmother used to cut this and put it in her socks and put it in her underwear drawer. This is what this one's for. This is to be used one year. Let it grow, harvest it in the winter, and don't expect it to come back because that's a zone six plant. It might, come back, it might have come back this winter since I think I'm in zone six right now. But this is, this is just a one year plant. Use it this year. A Shasta daisy, brand new Shasta daisy. Look at the spoons. And it unfurls those spoons as it, it matures. This is actually a five inch flower on this little short 10 inch plant. Nice big flowers. I like the Shasta daisies. My favorite is probably Becky. 
that's the one that seems to come back the best for me of all the, the hybrids. But this one, you know, we'll give it a try. It's, it's a zone four plant, so we should be able to do it. Rose Champion, I like the Dusty Miller type leaves on this. It's got a, a, a fuzzy Dusty Miller leaf on it, and then to add to that, this bright red magenta flowers. Cut it back after it's done blooming, and it will bloom again. The catch flies will do that. 20 to 26 inches. Here's one of the bee balms, and this is a short bee balm, only 20 to 24 inches. How many people have those bee balms that have the really ugly legs from powdery mildew? Flower on top, no leaves? Okay. Yep. One of the things that, that Tracy recommends in her book here, a uh, well-tended perennial book, she'll talk about taking the front of that bed and on the 4th of July, cut it in half. They'll still bloom but, and they'll be shorter and they'll cover up the ugly legs of their brothers behind them. So cut that, for that bed. You know, I've got a huge bed of, 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 of bee balm, which most people do if they've ever planted bee balm. And I can cut the front half of that bed down. It will bloom later, but, but it will stay nice and compact and it won't lose those leaves. Good air circulation is important on the bee bombs. This one is mildew resistant, as most of them are now, except for the ones that I have in my garden that I've had there for 15 years. Here's a new, a new evening primrose. The flowers on this are really nice, bright yellow. This is a short plant, but what's kind of cool is this needle-like foliage that shimmers, hence its name. It's got a sparkly shimmer to it, and it's got a three-inch flower on it. Now, if you've ever had an evening primrose, you know that these form a seed head right below the flower, and if you don't pinch that seed head off, it's not going to flower anymore. So it, it does require a little bit of maintenance. Uh, every other day, go out there. Check the old flowers, pinch the seed head, because if that seed head forms a seed, it's going to expand to about this big. And it's kind of got four sides on it, an accordion kind of thing. If it expands and it, it makes seed, the plant's not going to make any more flowers. Perennials want to make seed. If, they, if you allow them to make seed, they're not going to make flowers. If you want more flowers, don't let them make seed. Make sure you deadhead. So you'll have to deadhead the seed pot on the anithra. But I love the anithras. Such a wonderful spring flower. These are a new variety of peony from Monrovia. It's a cross between the tree peony and the shrub peony. It's a five foot shrub, but as the plant ages, the branches turn woody like a tree. But the reason they've done this is because we want to have shrub peonies that are in the yellows and the coppers and the, the light coral colors that we can't get with a regular shrub peony. You see how gold that flower is? That's how much they cost. <laughs> they, they are very pricey, but they are brand new. Um, and if you like peonies and you really, really like the peonies, these are going to bloom a lot longer than our shrub peonies do. They bloom most of the summer, which is kind of neat. And because they're a tree, they hold their flowers up so they don't flop like the traditional shrub peony. So it's, it's worth its time. Here's Carmen, Carmen. This is a red a poppy. Another thing that I can't grow in my yard because I'm too wet. If you've got a nice dry spot, well-drained place, the poppies will do fine. In a wet garden, they don't, they rot. Put those in the back of the border, they're going to be 15 inches, and they're going to bloom first, and then the other plants can come up in front of them and co cover up their ugly foliage that happens after they're done blooming. Don't deadhead them, and they'll self-seed. Here's another one, flamingo. Nice, pretty pink one. Isn't that neat? Isn't that neat? I wish I could grow these. These came out last year, the, the um, candy store bubblegum series. And what's really neat about these is that they're going to be about the same size, somewhere between 24 and 36 inches tall. They're going to bloom from June through September. The hummingbirds like them. The butterflies like them. They are powdery mildew resistant. And what's even better, that one smells like grape. This one smells like bubblegum. This one smells like cotton candy. 
Not really sure what coral cream drop smells like, but I think it had a mint smell to it. But so they've got fragrance along with the wonderful colors, about the same size, so they're not, and they're not going to sell seed like my purple one that gets all over my yard. Pretty cool, huh? Here's a new creeping phlox, and this has got a bigger flower than the traditional creeping phlox. Um, we've got whites and a couple different pinks and a purple in the creeping phlox family. This one's a white one, and I'm sorry about the photo. That's the best I could do. But it's a, it's a wonderful, sparkly, white creeping phlox. But I'm still going to take my creeping phlox out and put dead nettle in. Get rid of those Japanese beetles. Here's a Freelander Blue Prunella. It looks a lot like a, um, a Juga as far as the short ground cover type thing, but the flower is a lot bigger and chunkier. And the hummingbirds really like this one. Here's a, one of the black eyed Susans that's new. This is a scruffy leaf black eyed Susan. Scruffy leaf black eyed Susans don't get the mildew like the smooth leaf um, black eyed Susans. And scruffy leaf um, do not get eaten by the rabbits or the deer. The scratchy leaf plants, don't, they don't like as much as the smooth leaves. So they'll eat the smooth leaf, they won't eat the scruffy leaf. Scratchy leaf. And here's another scruffy, scruffy leaf one too. City garden. And all of a sudden I went to 0 0.75 to 1 foot instead of inches. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> uh, Blue Ridge sedum, little ground cover sedum. Only about 3 or 4 inches. I saw this planted up the other day. It's cute. It's just really a cute little ground cover. Um, put that between the stepping stones in your garden. Put that um, in a rock garden. Just kinda, it makes a nice little puddle of this d deep dark blue with white flowers. Here's another short one, 0.25 feet. What is that? Four inches. Uh, four inches, and it starts off green, and as it ages into the summertime, it turns to red. Nice little ground cover sedum. I really like this. Some people don't like the cobwebs on the, on the hens and chicks, but I think this is kind of unique. You know, I've got that hens and chicks patch. I think I need to put a cobweb in, in the middle of it. And there's a black one, too. I think that one needs to go in the middle of those plain old common green ones. So a little short guy. I think I might actually do a strawberry pot in that this year. It's kind of neat. Uh, Stokes aster, the aster that blooms all summer long instead of in the fall. This is a wonderful big flower. I have a friend who, who has a whole patch of Stokes Aster, and I am envious. I think it's the sixth commandment about envy in your neighbor's garden. <laughs> um, but she has a wonderful patch of this and grows and, and blooms all summer long. Pretty neat. My last uh, slide today is the uh, um, Speedwell, the Veronica. Veronicas and Salvias often get confused or mixed between them. The nice thing about the Speedwell, or the Veronica, is that it will bloom a lot longer than salvia with no deadheading. Deadheaded a lot less often than you do the salvias. So I think that's it. This is, this is the uh, list of places that I stole the photographs from. <laughs> and there's a little bit of my garden again. And a little bit of my raised beds in my garden. And then the view. The raised beds and all that stuff is up in this area by the pond in that area. Okay, so let's uh, take a break and have some cookies and, and drinks and I'll come back with questions. <laughs>